All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining the first Snowball podcast. I've been asked maybe 150 times to 1,000 times, how are you able to create the results that you've created in such a short amount of time? What is the sophistication and art behind the viral traction that you've had thus far, the hundreds of thousands of people on your wait list, the early traction? Um, and we've gotten you know, a, a thousand thumbs up when it comes to the UI UX of the app. But really, the magic that happens is the brand, the philosophy. And so, um, as an introduction to myself, I am Perul Gadral, the CEO of Snowball, Snowball Money. Um, we are the easiest way to invest into a portfolio of cryptocurrencies. Um, I'll leave it at that. And the gentleman who we've been so fortunate to have do our branding for us is sitting to my right. His name is Ekram Ahmed. So to get started, Ekram, maybe you can give us a very high level overview of who you are, um, what your background is, where you learned branding, positioning, um, and the different customers, clients that you've worked with over the years. Awesome. Well, first of all, Pearl, thank you for inviting me onto uh, the inaugural podcast. It's really good to be here. Uh, my background, so in short, I'm a positioning and brand strategist. Uh, I'll go into more detail as to what that is. Uh, for many years, I was just a consultant, uh, focusing on mainly technology companies, positioning in the marketplace, and then also building a charismatic brand around them. Uh, I learned all this stuff from a woman named Andy Cunningham, who uh, launched the Macintosh with Steve Jobs and actually coined the, the category personal computer. You can read about her in Walter Isaacson's book uh, and that biopic of Steve Jobs. Uh, and so I basically was an apprentice for Andy for many years, and, and now uh, I kind of do it on my own and, and do a lot of PR work. Uh, that's me in a nutshell, and let's just dive right into it. Let's talk. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, tell me about the different customers, clients that you've worked with over the years. You know, so I've had the good fortune of working with uh, like an eclectic mix, like really a lot of startups, mid-stage and late-stage companies. And uh, I love the B2C side just because it's such uh, an emotional play. So when you're actually selling to consumers versus the enterprise, uh, two different sort of worlds, two different psyches. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've done Facebook, Google Cloud, Bill's Coffee. I did the BlackBerry Turnaround uh, out here in the East Bay, wow. Snapchat, uh, just a lot of cool, cool companies and, and like Tile, for example. And I met a lot of these founders really early stage, kind of like when Snowball started and then they kind of mushroomed into bigger things. Got it. Got it. And so were you working with these companies before they became unicorns or at the earliest days of inception? Mostly before. Yeah. Sometimes they come to me afterwards. Uh, usually when they do that, there is some form of like attraction issue. Like there's, you know, something's not working. Maybe they've sort of sat, they, what, what got them there isn't going to be the, the thing that's going to get them to the next spot. And usually it's before, like you, we kind of position right and then traction and magic happens. Wow. So if you can tell us like this whole idea of branding, it's quite a broad genre and broad topic. What specifically do you specialize in? Yeah. So the, the real specialty is uh, brand positioning. That's the, the real essence of it. And I can kind of go into that, but I think a lot of folks don't really fully understand that in order to build a world-class charismatic brand, you have to position right first. And if you don't do that, uh, the world will just kind of do it for you. I always like to say position or be positioned. Got it. Got it. So position or be positioned. So when you walked in um, to these brands, so the folks that are listening in here, um, they're either entrepreneurs probably mostly coming from the blockchain crypto space. Right. They're venture capitalists, they're marketers, and or they're dreamers. Um, and so you're starting your brand out. Where do you start? Do you create a product, get the traction? Do you find the customers? I mean, when you walk into the room of Snapchat and they're at the earliest stage, and maybe perhaps they have a little bit of traction, yeah. what, what, how do you, how do, what is a narrative? How do you get the conversation started? What is the most important part to start? Such a good question. Uh, I would say the first thing, I'll backpedal just a little bit. Let's just understand like what a brand like really is. Like if we were to trace back the sort of etymology of the term, it actually goes back to, to cows. So what folks would do, they would actually brand the cows 
in order to sort of like create differentiation or like, you know, tell one cow apart from another. So they would do some mark, if wow. you will, to actually brand the cow. Sure. So that's, that's the origin of it. And so to branding started from branding cows, you heard it here, folks. Yes. So that's actually the, the origins of it. And so, you know, to answer your question directly, the first thing is, is to deeply understand before you do anything else as to why you are different. And I'm not talking service level difference. Uh, I always like to say with my clients, eccentrically different. You, you want to get to the spot where you can like formidably say, we are the only company in the space that does what, right? And there's a very rational sort of articulation to that. At the end of the day, like a lot of this is just word of mouth conversation. Like, hey, like, have you heard about, um, you know, Snapchat? What is that and why should I care? Have you heard about Snowball? You know, Snowball is the first smart crypto investing platform, same thing. And so these words like only, these words like first are really important to better understand. And you want to do it in a way where no one else can really copy you. So I'd say the first thing is to, is to position. Uh, and so very uh, cogently, like articulate who you are and why you matter. If you don't, I, I remember one of the, the higher ups at Google Cloud, like straight up asked me, he said, do, do we need to like pick a category? And I was just like beside myself because if you don't choose a category, you're just going to be assigned one because it's the way human beings take in information. When we're presented information, our mind is trying to contain it because if we don't, there's cognitive dissonance. And in order to contain something, you, you, uh, the mind will just bucket it into things that are familiar. Uh, and so answer the questions, who are you? Why do you matter? Uh, and why your company? Why now? There's a rational articulation to it. There's an emotional articulation to it. And it really traces back to the brain and the human mind because we have a left brain and we have a right brain. Got it. Got it. So even going before that, you know, Snowball, it's a company, it's a product. We've launched in the market. We've gone through extensive branding exercises, but um, I think that it's not as typical for companies to focus so heavily on branding. And so I'm an entrepreneur with a product perhaps in the market, perhaps I have a white paper, early traction, and now I'm starting to look at the brand very seriously. Where do I begin? The first place to begin, as I said, is understanding your difference and then understanding what the right message is for that. Uh, that's absolutely key. I think, you know, Mark Benioff of Salesforce, who's built, you know, Salesforce into what it is, has this really great sort of statement that helped me understand marketing and sales and really how they should coexist. He talked about it in behind the cloud and he said, you know, marketing sort of is like the air cover blanketing the market with our message. And then sales was doing the one-on-one -on -one sort of like thing. And so I would say, get the message right. What exactly are you? What do you want one person to say to another person? Uh, it's as simple as that. And then from there build on top of, some of the psychological components behind the brand and think of the brand more as like a prize. People think of brand as like a signal that you kind of give out. It's not actually a signal. It's a response. You are rewarded a brand like the, the market sort of gives it to you if you do it right. So that means you should be hyper focused on how you signal to the world. And if you have a focused message and really communicate that, that's better. Now here's the key thing. Okay. One thing that I think Snowball has done a, an excellent job in, and this is even beyond like the work that we did together, is that uh, you guys really understand communication because communication, it's not just like words. It's, it's verbal, it's nonverbal, it's voluntary, it's involuntary. So you have to, you know, everything must trace back to the anchoring idea of your brand. And it's that singularity, it's that specificity that I think is really important. So if you take and deconstruct the Snowball website, if you deconstruct sort of like, you know, you travel across the world and you... You know, give talks about the future of crypto and where the, the space is going. Uh, just even the app, if you kind of like deconstruct all that, it leads back to the brand. Got it. Got it. So how does this whole idea of a mission statement, a vision statement, a lot of companies get this in the beginning, but it almost always evolves. Yeah. Um, and so is that a starting point? Is that a reflection? Uh, like, is that the crux of it, it's clear that you need to differentiate your brand. I think that's, that's kind of a no brainer. We all understand like, what is our moat? What makes us very different? But if I'm to come with a brand listening to this podcast for the first time, like specifically, what should I do that I have either done and I've done incorrectly or that 
I can do that will drastically move the needle. Right. And you've discussed like, you know, the mission vision, but you've taken it even further to their purpose statement. Yeah. So let's get definitions right here. Uh, I think a lot of folks kind of get this wrong. So your vision statement is the state of the world in which you hope to see. When all your work is done, what does the world look like? Do not confuse this with your mission statement. Your mission statement is what you do every single day to achieve your vision, AKA your North Star. Most companies actually don't really publish their vision statement. I haven't really seen it too much. I know I have some friends at SpaceX and I, I know they internally kind of do it. Occupy Mars, they have all these t-shirts that say that. That's sort of their behind the scenes vision statement. Your mission is far more actionable and it almost always starts off with a verb. So, you know, Tesla's, for example, is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. I think Starbucks, for example, is to, you know, nurture the human spirit one cup, one neighborhood at a time, something like that. Ted, spread ideas. Almost always we see companies publish their mission statement. It's really important, especially as you recruit, people want to know, you know, why everyone's showing up to work every day. Now, the sort of third layer is purpose. And very few companies actually even do this. And I think the most successful founders really begin and end here. What is the purpose? And really the sort of question to ask around this is, uh, you know, beyond making money, why am I even doing this? And the reason to articulate this is because people buy into the why. It is famously, famously said, I think, with Simon Sinek, you know, he wrote the book, Start With Why. People don't buy what you do. They don't buy how you do it, but they buy the why. And that's when you get into branding because you can think of branding as being synonymous with emotion. And you can think of positioning being synonymous with just rational thinking. And think of this as like the way the human mind kind of takes in information. We actually emotionally take, sorry, we take in information and we emotionally charge it first in the limbic system. And then we kick it up to the cerebral cortex and that these are the more rational parts of, of the brain. And I think when you, when you don't have that sort of like those two parts of the brain really meshed up, there's, in, there's actually cognitive dissonance and tension. And when you bring tension to the mind, the, the mind wants to dismiss it. So that's why you, you have to nail purpose really, really well. And only, and no one can fake it. Like I, you know, for, fake it for you. Like it is either there or it's not. That's one of the things I've always appreciated about you and Snowball. I think, you know, from the get go, there was this big vision around smart crypto investing and, and, you know, the difference between smart crypto and sort of dumb or just uh, the opposite of smart crypto and like the perils of going that way. And, and that kernel is really, I think, what has done well for Snowball. But I think part of it is because there's a really potent value proposition that, that meets the cerebral cortex and also the limbic system is happy because the emotional orders are there with the purpose, the mission and the vision, which makes for us to be convinced and really authentically convinced. And I think that's a key thing here. The best marketing is authentic. You cannot fool the market. Yeah. The market will, will, will un, unriddle all the fakeness over time. So I think the best founders really begin with that deep purpose. Got it. Got it. So what we've done at Snowball yeah. um, is to demonstrate the authenticity of the brand. So if you could see Snowball logo, the shirt, the Snowball refers to the Snowball effect. Right. Right. So the Snowball effect is... As you go down the mountain, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the mission, like our, our mission was to democratize access to information. But what our brand alludes to is growth um, and growth in your finances, growth in your freedom, growth in your happiness, uh, fundamentally growth. And we have these uh, concentric circles, which allude to this growth. And one thing that we've done to make sure that this message is very genuine. And like you said, your customers, they buy the why, is we focus internally with our teams on you know, a weekly and monthly basis. What are you doing internally to grow? How can we make you better? How are you growing towards your own personal goals in terms of learning, in terms of you know, finances, in terms of responsibility? We do that with our partners, we do that with our investors, hoping that this will also transpire to our customers. And so what would be an exercise someone, an entrepreneur could do with their team to create like the most genuine experience and what their mission is and realizing it through their brand? I'd say begin with purpose okay. and then work your way up there. 
uh, why are you doing this beyond just making money? That's the, that's the first question you must uh, ask. The second is what does the world look like as a result of all the work of all the hard work we're going to do? And then you get a vision statement and then be really focused on what you and the team are going to do every single day to get there and have a real pithy sort of verb and have a mission statement. And then you have your sort of three elements there. And so I'd say, uh, no brand can really exist without, uh, nailing those questions. Now, even if you nail those questions, you have to think of your brand as like a living, breathing thing. It can die. Uh, if you don't nurture it, if you don't grow it, if you don't engage the market to, uh, you know, nurture it with you, it will, uh, weather and way and, and die. And I think, you know, Steve Jobs kind of famously talks about this and he says, um, you know, for a long time, like I think right after he came back from next that the Apple brand had suffered from a lot of neglect yeah. and, you know, he was trying to kind of reverse that. And he said something that really stuck with me. And I, you know, we, I, I talk about this with just my clients is that it's really about values. Uh, because when you have a certain cornerstone value, so let's take Snowball, for example, growth is a big value that you guys all share. And this new asset class, you know, called cryptocurrency, many folks don't even understand it. They don't even know how to play in it and they don't want to miss out. And there's that fear of missing out. And so that financial freedom and to really attain that is part of growth. And, you know, those folks that are willing to grow and take risks with cryptocurrency share the same sort of values as us. And it's all about values. And I think for Steve, it was, you know, anyone uh, with passion can change the world. And that's what inspired the Think Different campaign and so many other things. And in his talk, he actually referenced Nike and that Nike has done some of the best marketing the universe has ever seen. And I think, you know, at least what Steve Jobs said, um, and Andy definitely like corroborated this, is that uh, you begin with your values. So if you really kind of sum it up, actually, vision, purpose, mission, it goes, up, it goes back to values. And you, you are your values. Because it's your values that help you make decisions, the toughest decisions. Got it. So you get your very clear uh, mission statement, yep. very clear uh, vision statement, very clear purpose statement. Yep. And after that, you define what your values are. Uh, you understand what makes you different. You talk about this concept of the storm of Jupiter. Yeah. Maybe you want to actually go into that in a little bit of depth. Yeah. So, you know, Perul and I, we, we meet up every so often and we have these like real like intense, just like discussions about the world and where it's going and, and just how to, uh, really, you know, lead the world into, in, in, into a better place. Like, you know, a lot of that goes into, and there's this concept of like the storm of Jupiter that we, we were talking about very recently. And it, it goes into a fundamental premise about, uh, you know, positioning and branding is that the only currency in this type of work, and we can use marketing as an umbrella here. So the only currency in marketing is attention. And your goal as a founder is to really think about how do I get attention onto what I am building and make it, in, in, and that's it, right? Like how do I get attention on it? And the key thing about attention, and it's written pretty heavily about this, like the attention economy, is that the way attention is transacted, attention is, is kind of like energy. It's neither created or destroyed. So that means in order to get attention, you must position around attention and siphon attention onto yourself. And what you do is that if you can get siphon attention off yourself, I'll give a great example. Recently, the governor of California, uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, put out uh, a major policy around uh, you know, athletes getting paid in college. And what he did was he got LeBron James to be on his show and it was, you know, the barber show or whatever. And LeBron James and Gavin Newsom both, you know, simultaneously talked about this and they sort of, you know, co-opted it together. Now, let's all be honest. There's a ton of attention on LeBron James. What he did was he positioned that policy around LeBron James, ultimately funneling all that attention onto himself and his policy. So what you do is you siphon attention and then you create sort of like the spot of Jupiter onto what you are building. And you do not want that attention to kind of get off of you. And you do a lot of PR around that. And public relations, it's all about being top of mind, tip of tongue, uh, being friendly with reporters. I know you guys do a lot of work with Forbes, for example. It's stuff like that. But A, get attention from spots where attention is already locked up. And this is where positioning comes in handy. And then B, once you actually get attention, 
make sure it stays on to you and focus all the attention like the storm that the spot of Jupiter, where it's just this chaotic like storm that just this gravitational force around it. Uh, I think Tesla, I think SpaceX have done phenomenal jobs of this uh, as, as great examples um, and snowball as well. Got it. Got it. So, okay. We want attention. We've got the mission vision uh, statement, et cetera, but where do I start? Do I go to a conference? Do I start buying ads? Uh, do I make friends with the reporters and convince them to write? Like, uh, you talk about this concept of own, earned, and purchase. And yep. So uh, what would be the most strategic way to spread the virus yes. of your brand such that it's not a factor of, okay, I had this press article which got us you know, 5,000 downloads or App Store of the Day feature which got us 25,000 da downloads. Right. Um, how do you create that consistent uh, – Hockey stick growth, which is essentially a series of architected S curves. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. So, everything you know, Perul mentioned this term called the virus. It's, it's such an interesting one, and, and I think it. We should devote some time to exactly what we mean by that. Up until now, everything we've discussed about is engineering this sort of virus. Think about in biological terms. I, you know, a lot of my background is in neuroscience. I did research at UCSF for many years and at UC Davis, and a virus, what it does is that it goes into a cell and it injects itself into the cell, ultimately taking over the entire cell and you know, like changing its DNA. Similarly, your content and your communication is the cell and your virus is this differentiated message, if you will, and brand. And you want to engineer that upfront right before you ever get out. So I would actually recommend to act in stealth until you engineer the virus and then exit stealth after that. And so incubate the virus and only spill it into like certain sort of trusted avenues. But then there should be a place where there's, there's an exit from stealth and there's like four iconic strategies to kind of get out of stealth. And we can talk about that. Engineer the virus. And then once you engineer the virus, you want to get it out. And, you know, you mentioned something really good, which is owned, earned, and paid. So the first thing you do is you, you inject the virus into your own channel. So this is your website. This is your app. This is your social channels, uh, one pagers, and all this type of stuff. And then you go into earned, and then you go into paid. Earned is like media coming to you and actually saying like, hey, I heard about this, and I want to write about this. And then paid is like, you know, actually advertising it on spots like Google, uh, like Google AdWords these types of things, Facebook posts, et cetera. Start, you know, leave that to the end because what you really want to do is you want to get people to talk about it. You want to create, frankly, buzz. Now, if you're in the B2B side, if you're doing an enterprise play, you're selling to businesses, your virus is very rational. Is it better? Is it faster? And is it cheaper? Better usually means less stress. And honestly, I play a real big importance on faster. Because anytime you bring the value proposition of like saving people time, people will listen. Think superhuman, the fastest email uh, service ever, right? That's, I think that's how they're positioning as. Uber, if you really think about it, we can get from A to B with many other avenues. We could take BART in the city. We could take, you know, MTA, all this stuff. But uh, re they're really selling me time. I know exactly when I'm going to get there. I know how fast I'm probably going to get there. I can like time the meeting really right. They're selling us time. And, you know, Think about that if you're on the B2B side. If you're on the B2C side, then you're thinking big time PR. You're, you're talking like, how do I go to a big congregation of people? And this is maybe where you can like, you know, give a talk or a speech or you can hijack a big event, kind of like what Twitter did. You can go to South by Southwest and you can sort of deploy Twitter and, and have people tweet for the first time and sort of hijack that event. You can do what Airbnb did and you can go to the DNC conference in Denver and they sort of like leverage that attention that was on there for a moment in time and sort of you know, capture that zeitgeist and put it onto your thing. So, you know, it requires a little bit of guerrilla PR. Uh, if you're on the B2C side, if you're on the B2B side, real rational messaging. And I would say uh, your business, your future business will come from your existing customers. Uh, so mix your current customers with your prospective customers as much as possible. And this is where big things like Dreamforce uh, are born and originated. What Salesforce has done, really all it really is, it's, it's a mixture of current prospects talking to uh, you know, future prospects. That's really all it is.
Mm. Mm. So, you know, this whole idea of owned, earned, purchased was most brands go straight to purchase. Yep. Um, but the strategy is to start with owned. Yep. And that owned, how do you acquire your own? And who is your owned? Yeah, owned is, is just stuff. It's really basic stuff that you can get for free that people will reference, right? So, like, I think of, like, websites, social media, um, you know, just like a blog post. Maybe it's, Quora, maybe it's Quora, for example. Stuff that you can, you know, even product hunt. You know, you sort of own that, real, you own a piece of real estate or, like, a profile, like, on these types of things. And then they kind of promote it from there. And I would say uh, that, that, you know, you have to blanket the message there from the beginning because the truth is is that people when they kind of hear about you they go on this sort of like fact finding like journey like they begin to sort of see like where you're trusted who else is writing about you so if you just start like with google adwords and they don't you know and they don't really see you covered in TechCrunch or covered in forbes or they don't see major logos on your website or they don't see you know like that cogent messaging that they can share or like a top name vc or whatever you lose trust and losing trust is, is, I mean, in any, I mean, it is the, you know, they, they, they talk about the speed of trust. Like when someone trusts you or someone trusts something, things just happen faster. That's just the way human beings speed are. Speed of trust. Yeah. So there's this concept of the speed of trust. And I think if you, if you do it the other way where you start with the virus and then you inject it into your owned and then you go into earned and then you go into paid from there, you will sort of like, you know, jump around this, you know, this fame, like chasm that like, you know, folks have written about and crossing the chasm, uh, mainly in the B2B space, but you, you, you want to build trust from the beginning and it kind of starts with just your own identity. Uh, so form your identity first and then blanket it and then get folks to write about it and then, and then advertise it. So in this world of a plethora of noise, our goal is to find and sell trust. Yeah. And we talked about this idea of owned, earned, and purchased. So it seems like most brands will go directly to purchase without having the trust, without having the owned media, you know, the logos, et cetera, the foundation set, becoming a thought leader. And so this seems like the idea that you're proposing is let's get the fire burning. Yeah. And that fire is burning via the first own channel, the earn channel, and then at that juncture, you can go to purchase such that you understand what your customer profile is. You have predictable growth. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So can you give me an example that you've walked in to some of these major brands? What have you done and said um, that's made a major difference for them? For example, um, Snapchat. Right. What, what was Snapchat's biggest challenge that they were facing? And how were you able to work through that challenge? Yeah. So the thing about Snapchat, um, one of the things I think that they didn't fully understand was this, this notion of like a viral coefficient. And um, I actually call it like a self-referencing coefficient. And, you know, if you think about what a market really is, it's the thing that really uh, defines a market is their shareability, their speakability, how much they sort of like reference each other. And part of the problem there was that it wasn't really being picked up like in the early days at Stanford. And what they needed to do was sort of like lock into an early, early target market. And the key thing there is that you don't want to be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's like a recipe for a disaster. So if you're trying to please everyone, uh, you're just going to please no one. And you really want to say no. So a good question to ask, and all you founders should definitely ask this, is what are we saying no to? Because if you keep saying no, we will eventually get to the yes of what our true identity. And so think about how this is a major takeaway, and I hope you guys all leave with this, is that the biggest companies in the world all begin deceptively small. Amazon was a leading online retailer for books. At one point in time, Facebook was just this college thing. You needed a .edu to even get onto it. Yammer, same thing. You needed a, co a corporate email. And Snapchat, because they weren't like getting product market fit in the beginning, they actually went to high school students in LA, in Southern California, and it was a way to cheat on exams in the beginning. That's actually like the, 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 the nascency of Snapchat. And so from there, it became like the sexting app 
And they didn't really, you know, confirm or deny it. They just let the PR kind of happen uh, from there. But think about what they did. They niche down. They focus on a really, really small segment of the market that all references each other. Nike, what it really started off was with runners. It was a running shoe in the beginning. All runners talked to each other. It became like in the running community. And then they built a tribe around there. And then they kind of went from there. And the concentric circles, uh, you know, went really big. And so, you know, to answer your question sort of pointedly, I'd say it's really important as like a founder for you to think of the tip of the iceberg and be like, okay, like if we want to be the everything store, we need to first be the leading online retailer for books. If we want to be this, you know, giant uh, behemoth of like a, you know, Snapchatting thing uh, and a form of communication, we need to focus on high school students Etc. And then you can have like a controlled growth model to reveal more of the iceberg over time. And so this iceberg concept is absolutely critical to nail. And remember, your early position, you're not married to it. You can evolve away from it given the timing of the market after maybe a year, year and a half, and you can you can go from there. Checkpoint, uh, global cybersecurity company. I do a lot of PR work with them. Uh, they were a firewall company in the beginning, and now they need. Uh, cybersecurity solutions globally, but trace its origins 25 years ago. All it was was selling firewalls. Very interesting. Very interesting. So it seems like you need to understand who you are, what you stand for, create a moat around your value proposition, go through the owned, earned, and purchased. Um, but what if what you're building doesn't find product market fit? And when do you know to pivot? Um, or when you achieve product market fit. And it just to final to summarize the summary, uh, it seems like uh, we should, as a company, you should focus, your focal point should be one specific product feature and creating a moat around that versus being a Sears or a Costco that's offering everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So here's what I would say is that, you know, product market fit. It's, it's a real difficult thing uh, to really achieve. I think the way you know you have it, um, frankly, it's kind of like pornography. You know it when you see it. It's as simple as that, right? And so it, it's sort of explosive. Like there, it's just like, oh my God, like the inbound is just in, insane. And that's when I think you have like product market fit because there's just this insane adoption curve. Beware because it could saturate and then you may have to find like a different thing. But, um, you know, trace... You know, if, if you don't have product market fit, there's usually a couple things. Number one, if you're getting inbound and people are just coming into you and you're not closing, it's a sales problem. If you are not getting inbound, then it's probably a marketing problem. And if you are um, kind of, if, if you're just not getting inbound and, and uh, yet people aren't like closing with it, especially on the product side, then it's a product problem. So you got to figure out who's to blame. Is it really marketing? Is it really sales? Is it really product? Honestly, if you have a good product, it helps marketing a lot. And I would say that nothing makes an excuse for having a shitty product. Uh, you just, it's tough to just circumvent that all the best marketing in the world can't really get it. Like if me and you popped open the Mac and it just didn't work, <laughs> it's, you know, it doesn't matter how good and sleek it looks. We're just not going to use it. And I would say nail the product, then focus on marketing and then focus on sales uh, from there. But having a brand is only really earned if you have a real world-class product. You mentioned sharpening the product. That's actually a really smart thing because uh, oftentimes many folks try to go out there and sell a Swiss army knife, but people only really want one part of the Swiss army knife and, you know, take away and remove all the distractions from that tip of the angle and be like, okay, like, Hey, we're Instagram. Yeah, we do a lot of things, but, the spear is filters and take that to market and you'll get a lot of adoption. For example, yeah. they sharpen the product and sort of closed it down bourbon and they, they created Instagram because they, they trim the fat and focus on filters. Got it. And so we've been going for about 40 minutes now. It yep. seems like more people have joined and not very many people left or nobody's wow, left. That's a lot of people there, which means um, the content is, is, is valuable. And so I want to open the floor for specific questions that you, the viewers, have specifically to your brand or just conceptually. And while those questions are coming in, uh, you can, there's a Q&A tab here. 
Um, I think there's a red message sign above it with a one. So feel free to put your questions in over there or put it in the chat. Um, and while those questions are funneling in, I wanted to ask, um, when it comes to branding, there's many different types of brands. Yeah. Um, for example, Lyft is the mother versus Uber, which is the Sage. Sage. So yeah, Uber is actually, so I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, what Perula is referring to is this framework that is really important to understand. You are only one of three types of companies. Mm -hmm. You are either a product centric company, you are either a customer centric company, or you are a concept centric company. So when you think of a product centric company, think of superhuman, think of um, Oracle, think of Microsoft, these types of companies, strong dev cultures, Palantir, for example, they recruit some of the best engineers and they will compete on features mm -hmm. and or value. But they're the ones that like really bet everything on the product and they just will go out there and be like, hey, honestly, we have the best product, take it or leave it. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and the perils of not going with, us, going with us is a really, you know, shitty experience with the product. So if you're not that, then you're a customer centric company. Think Lyft. There's a reason why they are your friend with a car. Uh, there's a reason why Nordstrom, you go in there and you don't have to return anything with the receipts. Uh, they just kind of do it for you. There's a reason why Amazon uh, has the mission statement, we are Earth's most customer-centric company. Sure. And if you're going to play there, you differentiate based off experience and or a segmentation. Okay. And so you hyper-focus, like I'm only going to focus on these guys, like I'm Forever 21, and I'm only going to focus on this segment. Or it's an experience and you offer some differentiated uh, like, you know, way of working with you uh, and you kind of go down that, down that path. If you're not one of those two, then you are a concept centric company. These companies are very unique. I think Snowball has always been one of these where you are fundamentally out there to change and inspire new behavior. And usually you differentiate based off either two big axes. A, the next big thing. So you basically say, hey, the era of this is done and the next big thing is SaaS and we're Salesforce and we're bringing SaaS to the world. Uh, or you are a sort of virgin, you have a very charismatic leader, Richard Branson, and through sheer cult of personality, you create almost like a religion and you, you march forward and you create this tribe behind you and you force your way down that way. It's not to say that you are, uh, you know, the other two are not there if you have one, you have facets of each of them, but there's a dominant sort of anchor identity there. So Uber is probably started off as a concept centric company uh, and then, you know, migrated over to product over time and then Lyft positioned as a customer centric company as an example, or Microsoft has historically been a product centric company. And then, uh, you know, Steve Jobs and Apple came out and said, we are, uh, you know, a concept and, you know, we're thinking differently and these types of things. So just because you're in the same category competing, uh, does it means you can still find your sweet spot there and you want to get to a point where you take the number one and number two and you're either one of number one or number two and you compete directly head on because uh, all categories funnel into a number one, number two. So think Pepsi, Coke, PC, Mac, think Uber, Lyft, these types of things. And you want to just get to there. And so figure out who you are and make sure you pick your, your correct differentiation axis. Got it. Got it. So can you talk, uh, well, actually, why don't we answer one of the questions that have come sure. up and folks, please feel free to ask more questions. Um, does a logo make or break a brand? And I know you've referred to, um, the founder of, of North face yeah. when it comes to logo. So yeah. yeah. Question. Does, does a logo make or break a, a brand? Yeah. So I did. So yes, I would say the logo uh, makes or break, breaks your brand. Um, I'll, I'll say one thing before this. Um, if you look at the persuasion stack and I did a lot of research on this, uh, you know, at UCSF there, there human beings are persuaded in sort of like a stack. Uh, the first thing that human beings are most persuaded by is fear. Uh, and so as marketers, you, you really want to, really kind of frame this idea in the mind of your market. If you don't go with our product or service, these are the perils of, of, of it, right? So if you don't go with us or else, 
So you want to do some fear of missing out. Like what exactly are they missing out on? I have a lot of clients that come to me and say, Hey, like this is really important. This is really different. The world should care about this. And then uh, we're solving this problem. And then I'll interview their customers and, and they'll be like, you know what? This is a nice to have. It's not a must have. Uh, I can live without it. It's really not that much of a pain. So it's really important to understand that. And so number one, people are most persuaded by fear. Second, they're most persuaded by visual forms of communication. So when we see something, uh, we, we, we're very persuaded by it. So this is why Instagram is so addicting. This is why the gaming industry has taken off so much. Fortnite, uh, think, you know, frankly, pornography, not to bring that term up too much here, guys, but, you know, things like that, they're very addicting in nature. So your logo is a visual representation persuader of what you're doing. And I did a little bit of work with the, uh, with the, with the North Face and the founder of the North Face, uh, you know, gave me something that he really left me with. And he said, you know a good logo when your customer, if you ask them to draw it from sheer memory, they could actually draw the caricature of the logo. So if I asked you guys to draw the logo, the swoosh symbol of Nike, I think almost all of us can actually, you know, draw it up. If we did it with, you know, maybe Target, for example, we could probably do the bullseye thing. You know, Snowball has like a, a world-class logo as well. Just those concentric circles and the Snowball really just you know, affecting growth. Uh, I think it's great. You know, if you ask someone to draw it by memory, do it. But if they can't really do it, then I don't think you've done a good job in terms of a logo because it doesn't imprint on the mind. And that's really what it's about. Can you burn the symbol into the mind? And I would say, uh, you know, to, to, you know, think even beyond, poly, even beyond like uh, startups, entrepreneurship and technology, think of other examples of where even uh, political leaders, like think, uh, you know, even Adolf Hitler, for example, if I said draw the Nazi symbol, uh, probably a lot of us could. And, you know, he leveraged a lot of the marketing techniques that, you know, entrepreneurs use uh, to, you know, do what he wanted to do. So think even beyond that, you know, a good logo if people can actually draw from memory. After looking at it for three seconds, is that right? Yeah, after looking at it for three seconds. And that's a real, real key thing. Quick got flash, it. can they draw it again? Got it, got it. Um, I see that there's a couple more questions, but I think that this has been very, very helpful. Um, this has been extremely informative, especially for me. Uh, hopefully this has been very valuable for you folks. But we will continue to have podcasts like this on a monthly basis. Um, We've been so fortunate to have folks like Ekram be part of our, our circle here at Snowball. Um, you know, we've got investors like Kevin Lin, co-founder of Twitch, Sam Zaid, CEO of GetAround, um, former John Dillon, former CEO of Salesforce, et cetera. Um, and so if this is something, if there's a unique topic that you would like for us to present to you, and if you found this to be very valuable, and if you have follow-up questions, please, please, please follow up. What's the best way to follow up, Ekron? E at snowball.money? Yeah, you could do that. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, E-K-R-A-H-M. And then uh, if you need to reach me directly, it's Ekram at 3EKV.com. Got it, got it. Looks like we've got a bunch of questions that have just piled in, so we'll answer a, a couple of these. Um, and the rest, please follow up uh, via email or Instagram or Twitter. Um, and we'll be sure to share your questions with the rest of the community as well. Um, and really, really thanks for coming in. So uh, any books that you recommend for the psychology of sales? Yes. Um, for the psychology of sales. There's one called Persuasion that I really like. I think it's good. I forget the author, but I remember that book. And I would say another one is Robert Greene's, uh, the, I think it's called The Art of Seduction. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good one as well. He, he talks about how people are persuaded and seduced. And if you really think about marketing, uh, there's a very seductive sort of nature to it. And you want to leverage some of those same principles. Okay. Um, so Ash works in branding at a small scale. Yep more like individuals building their brand is drilling someone's SOB story in all, in all content, a good or bad idea. <laughs> As, <laughs> so, so I'm a big fan of storytelling and I think storytelling is uh, really important. Um, so yes, like you, you want to weave together a, a really good story and you want 
uh, it to stand out and, and you want it to embed it everywhere. Uh, so, you know, it's important, but I would say in storytelling, it's, it's important to do something kind of unique, right? So it's called an information gap. Uh, you want to give a little bit of information, create curiosity, and then close the gap of information with the story that only with the information only you can close. And so set yourself up right so that they're kind of uh, really lured into your story. Like think of a movie, you know, they kind of set it up and they, they create all this, they create this information gap and curiosity and you sort of follow along for the adventure. Got it. Um, awesome. Any final pieces of advice you'd like to leave with our viewers? Yes, I would say, one of the key things is sum up your brand in one word. When we think of Volvo, we think of safety. Volvo has paid a lot of money for us to think safety. BMW, performance. Mercedes-Benz, luxury. Optimizely, AB testing. Snowball, smart crypto investing. If you can sum up your brand in one word or phrase and then burn that word, that synonym, into the market, you're going to be a lot better off. Do not let the market do it for you because people will actually slander you, your competitors will slander you, and then folks will actually deposition you. I think the President of the United States does a really good job of this. Uh, think of like low energy Jeb. Think of the do nothing Democrats. He just came out with this last week. Things like that. So you can actually position yourself in one word or phrase and you, actually, you can actually deposition your competition in one word or phrase. This goes back to human psychology the, the mind is very influenced by language. And I actually do believe that language is probably one of the most profound inventions of human beings. And uh, so think about that, you know, sum up your brand in one word or phrase, you're gonna be better off. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ephraim. This was a pleasure, it was great to be here. Uh, Snowball has been so fun to work with, lots of good things. And I look forward to the next time. Yeah, wonderful. And if you wanna get uh, in touch with Ekram, you have more questions, there's several different channels, e at snowball.money or uh, ikram at 3ekv.com. And then my Twitter handle is at E-K-R-A-H-M. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and just to close, this podcast will be available on several different channels. If you subscribe to the link to get you here, you will be getting a follow-up email with uh, this specific video. It'll be posted on YouTube and um, a number of different channels, et cetera. Um, we will also be syndicating this across 6 million viewers. And so while we had a handful of people come uh, for this live podcast, there will be uh, hundreds of thousands of viewers. So if you know someone that could benefit from this, we would love for you to share this with them, tag them on the social media, on YouTube, et cetera, connect them with us. Um, and if you know an excellent speaker who could be extremely valuable to our community, uh, on a different topic, entrepreneurship, growth, um, cryptocurrencies, the evolution of the markets, et cetera. We would love, love, love to hear from you. So thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in. Really excited to start this off. Um, and we look at, we're very excited to hear from you. And I'll close with finally, Snowball is available on the App Store. It's the simplest and easiest way to invest into a portfolio of cryptocurrencies. We've got really exciting things that are on the horizon. I, can't wait to talk about them, but we're making a major, major pivot. We asked the community what they want to see with the extremely volatile crypto market. And now we've listened and we have something really, really enticing coming up on the horizon. So thanks for tuning in everyone. Look forward to being connected. Have a wonderful day. Cheers guys.